Coming up, the best of the best from 2017. We take a look at some of your and our favorite stories, like learning to fly a P-51 Mustang. And hanging out with a biplane on floats and cruising hot and high in a hot rod Cessna. Or going low and slow across the deserts of Nevada and a spot landing in Alaska. We'll bring warbirds back to life and the sun will go away, but then Cuba will come into view. And that and a look at our wins for general aviation for the year. AOK Live this week, the Director's Cut 2017 starts in just a moment. Build and flying with the Sonics Aircraft B models. The B models offer more room and comfort, more fuel, more panel space, more engine choices, and the same great Sonics Aircraft flight characteristics. Learn more at sonicsaircraft.com. What a year it has been. Welcome to the Director's Cut of AOPA Live this week. I'm Paul Harrop alongside Warren Morningstar and Josh Cochran. <laughs> Together we produce the show each week. And now that we're into the holiday season, we wanted to share our favorite stories of the year with you. And we begin with some news and a holiday present, believe it or not, from the FAA. It was definitely on our wish list. A clear declaration from the feds that airport sponsors are required to promote reasonable FBO pricing and fee transparency and also to protect public access to the airport. In the release, in the policy, they reiterated several times, fair, non-discriminatory, transparent pricing. Um, these are important basic topics to understanding what competition bring to the market, making sure that uh, our aviators are getting a fair shake. It is also important to always point out that the large majority of our FBOs that service our general aviation population do a really good job. Now these aren't new regulations or price controls, just a clear explanation of FAA policy and the obligations of airport sponsors who take federal tax dollars. The FAA document refers to reasonable fees and pricing practices at least 20 times, so it's pretty clear they're now serious about this. It just took a little push from AOPA and AOPA members. You can read more about it on our website. It's got to be one of the biggest stories of the year, certainly the biggest airplane we've featured this year. B-29 Superfortress Dock is back in the air after decades of restoration. Al Marsh has the story. Seventy years ago, a B-29 loaded with bombs was a slow climber. Today, a B-29 that will never again carry bombs climbs for the first time in decades. Volunteers in Wichita have rebuilt Doc, and this is their story. Well, it, it, it was a little heavy on the, on the controls, but uh, uh, it's a good flying aircraft. And, uh, uh, of course, they didn't expect you to be doing any acrobatics in it, you know. It was quite an aircraft first day. And actually, it was the biggest gamble that the War Department made. It cost $3 billion, that program. And uh, the Manhattan Project cost $2 billion. In 1956, all of the airplanes became property of the Navy again, and they shipped all the remaining airplanes out to China Lake to be used as ballistic targets. And so they, uh, they ran bombing missions and, and destroyed most of the airplanes, but they never did hit the airplane. So we're, uh, if they had, we wouldn't be here today. And now, 15 years and about almost 300,000 volunteer hours later, you, uh, you get the airplane over here and it, it's a it's a it's a special project a lot of the volunteers were Boeing mod mechanics they were the best at what they did over the years yeah we've had hundreds of people uh, some of them folks have just lost interest a lot of folks have passed away gone on to different jobs elsewhere we've still had this core team that about anywhere from 30 to 50 people that just is in love with this airplane. My husband thought it was a good idea. He gave us something to do because we were both retired. My passion for my husband is what keeps me coming in. Is It's his dream, so I've made it mine also. 
said to myself, this is a dream that he was hoping for. Of course, he didn't live long enough, but it's okay. He's seeing it. <laughs> Three eyes and four ears. <laughs> Over 15 years, we've become a pretty good family. We have a good time. We're just kind of a family of bums building airplanes. <laughs> The person to be honored the most is Tony Mazzolini, because, you know, Tony's basically the savior of the airplane. <laughs> we were trying to figure out what to put on his business card. <laughs> we didn't think savior was maybe <laughs> the right thing to put on there, but, you know, without Tony, there'd be no doc. My dream was to recover it, uh, restore it, and uh, fly it. And I wanted to have this as a flying museum. Those people that were on the home front that helped build these airplanes, the people that went into military service, those who had served, flown, built, and ultimately made their, their sacrifice in this aircraft. I wanted to honor them. Our younger generations, our current generations, and future generations do not know this history. And this is a way of bringing it to them. Doc's first mission was just to fly. Its second mission is to find funding for a permanent home in Wichita and teach history to the nation. Al Marsh, AOPA Live. Wow, how cool was that, guys, at AirVenture to get to see Doc and Fifi fly together in formation? Yeah, probably will be the only time we'll see the two of them together. I but can't imagine what it costs to fly these things. It is amazing. You know, sort of a, fun, a funny thing, when because they had to maintain these birds out in difficult areas, the, I understand that the maintenance manual, uh, for example, when you're torquing certain bolts, it's like find a 120-pound airman and hang off of, of a 12-foot lever on the wrench. It's Diets were different back then. I think I had a hard time finding the 125 pound airman. Well, that's funny. It's a beautiful machine and kudos to Doc's friends for putting all the work into that over the decades. Towards the end of the year, we saw a unique innovation combining two of our favorite things. It's the YMF 5F Float Waco. Brash, over the top, totally impractical, and absolutely irresistible. This Waco YMF 5F is the first of the modern biplanes handmade in Battle Creek, Michigan to set upon amphibious floats, and it's a mind bender. It's got an incredible wow factor, not only on the ramp, but also in the water. If you're at a dock with this thing, you're an, you know, it's for good or bad, you're an instant celebrity. Waco Classic President Peter Bauer's real motivation for building the first amphibious Waco is personal, not strictly commercial. I received my float rating about a year ago and was just thrilled with how fun it was to fly and the types of different experiences you could have with a float plane. A number of recent innovations make the float Waco possible. The culmination was getting a new propeller approved from MT, which is a lightweight composite propeller. A few years ago, we introduced what was called the D-model Waco, and that featured a new 300 horsepower engine. Combined with these composite floats that I'm sitting on from Aeroset, those three things really gave us what we needed to make a great float plane. On its four wheels, the big candy apple red biplane is mountainous. The airplane's handling qualities are more sedate than wheeled versions. The roll rate is slightly slower, and pitch and roll forces seem heavier but harmonious. Runway landings are childishly simple. Put the landing gear down, hold 85 miles an hour on final, round out, and you'll touch down a few seconds before you expect to. It's just that tall. On the water, the Waco glides serenely. Its 300 horsepower radial engine rumbling with the calm confidence that it can roar into the air at a moment's notice. Takeoffs on the water are surprisingly short. The Waco accelerates briskly at full power, and with full back pressure, it's on the step in about three seconds. Water ops are pure exhilaration. And exhilaration for pilots and passengers is what the float Waco is all about. This airplane, from the pilot's perspective, was just wonderful. 
but you put a passenger or two passengers in the front seat and they'll in every case find it to be a once in a lifetime experience and something that they remember for their whole life. It's just a whole lot of fun. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. Wow, that was beautiful, and kudos to our buddy over here who produced and shot that piece. Thanks. Yeah, it was. Uh, we shot that on the way down to the Tampa fly-in, and so it was really a uh, beautiful airplane to well, see well, and shoot on the way. Well, tell us what airplane you were shooting out And of. I uh, shot shot it out of a, a Super Cub on floats, which I rode in most of the way down to Tampa, which was a Some lot of fun. Some this guy has, huh? <laughs> that was beautiful so. there on, on Lake Anna, and what a magnificent, if not odd, machine. So yes. Great job on the story there, Thank Josh. Thank you. Well, look out, Marty McFly. We're going back to the future with this next one. Somehow I found the words to describe what it's like to fly my favorite airplane of all time. They say never meet your heroes, but in January, I took the flight of my life in a beach starship. We're taking off from North Texas Regional Airport in a truly rare machine. They're touching a starship, taking the runway for departure now. Starship, take me with you. They were touching go. Falling. <laughs> I'll say that. Of the 53 Beechcraft Starships built, five still fly. Four are in the United States, and Raj Narayanan has two of them. These are not hangar queens. These airplanes fly every couple weeks or doing some sort of mission somewhere um, for our business. And aviators are always excited to see them. First of all, they're always shocked that there's an airplane still flying. Raj uses them as a business tool for his company, Aerospace Quality Research and Development in Addison, Texas. You know, I was looking for a very capable twin engine airplane that had uh, um, some sort of composite construction. And Starship fits perfectly into his company's typical mission profile. Generally from Dallas, we are going out to the West Coast and the East Coast um, nonstop. But beyond its usefulness as a traveling machine, the airplane is just cool. For an owner flown airplane, the Starship is a very well behaved, responsible, cost manageable airplane to owner fly. Flies great, flies like any other airplane. It's heavy on the controls. It's classic beach design. Um, it's a lot of airplane, lots of redundancy, lots of safety. Uh, it's built very, very well. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a very solid airplane, uh, but without boosted flight controls, um, it's a handful and you have to muscle the airplane around. The other challenge is maintaining a 30-year-old machine that was light years ahead of its time. Parts are key, and uh, he who has the parts is king. And um, you know, between uh, uh, you know the owner of uh, NC51 out on the west coast and myself, we've got the lion's share of the hardware on the airplane. Raj and the other owners intend to keep the fleet going long past their lifetimes. Um, the problem with the airplane will be the systems. It'll be the avionics, um, CRT technology. It will be um, some of the you know the hydraulics and the pneumatic equipment that we'll have to deal with. But they're stocked and ready to keep the dream of Starship alive. It's been a wonderful experience. It's been a great learning experience. The airplane has been a dream to fly. A lot of people around the country appreciate the airplane. It's what we've been invited to share it with a lot of people. And uh, so that's been a really cool experience. And, uh, and we, use, we use the airplane. We, we really put it to work. Special thanks to Raj and Sharesh Narayanan for hosting us and letting us play with their amazing starships. And a special shout out to Glenn Watson from Mach Point One Aviation Photography for flying platform for the air to air. He really made that shoot work on a bumpy night. Well, Paul, speaking of another impressive beach, one from a different era, one pilot in LA has one of the finest restored Beach 18s out there. AOPA senior photographer Mike Pfizer shows us. <laughs> I fell in love with this airplane the moment I saw it, the moment I flew it was a pretty magical special experience and I said we've got to have this airplane. This is going to be the ultimate vintage airline charter machine on the planet. We have a 1957 Beach E18S 
9,600 pounds of more fun than you can possibly stand. It's like the Indiana Jones of flying. 900 horsepower of Pratt & Whitney, sound and fury, room for eight people and absolute luxury, and cruising on the coastline at 1,000 feet, doing 150 knots, it's as good as it gets. This one's particularly special because somebody took the trouble to spend a half a million dollars getting it right. And I looked at the interior and I go, you're kidding me, right? I mean, it's over the top with the, got the Burlwood table that comes out, the, the club seating with the epic seats in it that really recline. You can carry 400 pounds of cargo and six people really comfortably. And the look of it is actually cooler. I love the twin tails. It really captures the essence of that Art Deco Lockheed 12 look but more comfortable and more usable and more luxurious. Wendy, Tango, Tango, Chino, Tower, 1310 at 5. Runway 26 left, clear for takeoff. 26 left, clear for takeoff, uh, Twin Beaches, over 10 to When you fly the beach, it's like driving a train. I, it's, I don't always think of it like that, it's just funny, but it's got aileron trim, it's got rudder trim, it's got an elevator trim, and I do it all manually, and I, and I just love tweaking it and tuning it and making it fly perfectly. That's the the art of flying a beach 18 and once you fly it you'll never forget it it's it's very responsive and it's easy to trim out completely and a lot of airplanes don't do that and that's part of the magic of flying a beach the beach 18 mission uh, with blackstone airways i'm happy just flying it around downtown la at sunset fly over past the hollywood sign and griffith park and over hollywood hills my favorite missions are going out of town. I would like to go out to Catalina a lot. We bring people out to Catalina to do hiking. They'll fly out there, drop them off, and then they can hike for the weekend. So when you have a plane like this, load it up with four of your buddies, put 400 pounds of your gear that you need to have an amazing, adventurous weekend, and go. Wow, that really is a beautiful airplane. And when we come back, more of our hits from this year, like air to air with a flight of six Mustangs and flying the Cirrus jet. AOPA Live this week, the Director's Cut 2017 continues in just a moment. Purchasing your own aircraft is an exciting experience. AOPA Finance simplifies the process, saving you money with lower interest rates and hassle-free loans, so you get into your new aircraft sooner. AOPA Finance, the right approach to buying an aircraft. Welcome back. General aviation serves America and beyond, of course, and that is especially true during times of crisis. During the hurricane season this year, GA really stepped up. Here's a report from Tom Haynes, who was in the middle of it. I'm at Summerlin Key, Middle Key, one of the most heavily damaged uh, parts of Florida. And uh, I've been busy this week, along with a whole lot of other pilots and other volunteers, uh, getting a sense of what it is that general aviation can, can do in a situation like this to make a big difference. We landed in Lakeland, where the Sun and Fun grounds became our base of operations. Aerobridge and Operation Airdrop were on scene helping to match up the needs on the ground with the capabilities of the volunteer pilots and aircraft. In Ocala, a semi full of medicine, water, and other supplies was waiting for us. We're going to load these uh, four airplanes up with much uh, critically needed supplies, and we're going to get these uh, four airplanes headed back south. We didn't make it to the Keys that first day, just back to Lakeland, where volunteers from a local university were waiting to load up a trailer and get things moving farther down the line. Meanwhile, two rental trucks driven by AOPA staffers were headed to Florida. AOPA had put out a call for donations to the Frederick community, and they came rolling in to the National Aviation Community Center. By the second day, our mission was better defined. Stockpile needed supplies in Homestead, and then move them to the cutoff communities in the Florida Keys. First stop, Sugarloaf Key, where the local police officer said they really needed food. We had about a thousand pounds of food and needed items and easily got our aircraft into the narrow private strip. Then over to Summerlin Key, another private strip. Our first response that we dropped in uh, right when we got here, um, people started kind of coming out of the woodwork like it wasn't a city in the United States. And Peter Burwell flew his caravan down from Minnesota to help out. There was a guy in a pickup driving on this road right here that was handing out water and food and people were coming out, hey, do you have food, do you have food, do you have water? Um, and then that's when it kind of hit that these people haven't had any of this stuff for the last few days. And 
and really uh, highlighted the need for, for general aviation to start moving supplies in here. And move supplies he did. I'm probably just short of 10,000 pounds of food, water, get generators, gas, um, baby diapers, uh, hygiene, sanitary things. Um, we just keep dropping it in from, from all the donations from around the country. Mm -hmm. Back in Olmstead, our trucks picked up more donated supplies and later delivered them to the Keys after pushing through some official red tape. So if we can guarantee that you guys get insulin on your plane and we know within a few hours it's gonna be in St. Croix, that's gonna potentially save someone's life today. Okay, so. AOPA's CJ3 dispatched on a life-saving mission to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. In addition to the insulin, more than $300,000 worth of antibiotics. The return flight evacuated stranded U.S. citizens. And the cycle repeats. Find a need that only GA aircraft can fill and go do it. So ironically, this small private airport, Summerlin Key, has become a, a center for relief efforts because the military and others have taken over the large public airports and basically shut off access to a lot of the re relief efforts from the civilian world. So General Aviation's had a real impact and kind of going in the nooks and crannies, making a difference here. And uh, Mark Baker has been here all week, kind of helping with that, but also trying to clean up his place. Well, using the, the couple of private airports that do exist here right now is early relief and to assess the damage. And we've been bringing people in and generators in and ice and water in as well. Um, the military seems to be doing a pretty good job in Marathon and Key West, but in the middle keys here where there's a lot of damage, uh, they're focusing their interests primarily in those two places, which I'm, makes sense. So General Aviation is uh, standing up here. We've got everything from a couple of caravans to a Pilatus to Bonanzas and 182s, bringing stuff in and out of this, uh, this airport and a couple of the others. So that's the story from Florida for now. Lots more to be done here. Plenty of opportunities for people to come down and participate, particularly uh, labor needed right now to help clean up. Well, you know, guys, I was with Tom on that trip, and the thing that I think was most impressive was the way people, uh, and particularly pilots, just pitched in to help whatever needed to be done. They did it, like uh, Peter Burwell there with the uh, caravan. I mean, that man was a going machine. He was just flying mission after mission after mission. It's amazing how these airplanes can get in places that, you know, how you wouldn't get there by car or truck, not until they open the the highway back, airplanes are the only way in and out. Well, it would be no exaggeration to say that there's some people on the Keys who would have been really hungry and thirsty if it hadn't been for GA, because at the beginning of this, it was, you know, it's disorganized chaos. And the official response teams were uh, a little slow getting off the mark to getting help to people in the Keys. Well, you know, it is a slogan, but it is also reality. General aviation absolutely serves America and beyond in times of yeah, crisis. So. Really glad that we could step up as a as an industry and, and help out, so that's good. Well, it's not the sexiest thing AOPA does, but it's the most important for our members. We call it advocacy, and 2017 was a really good year. For our members, a lot of really good things happened. Uh, things that I'm really proud of. Our, our member engagement was never higher in terms of whether it's the fly-ins, you know, uh, up over 70% of the year before. Over 150,000 of our AOP members wrote to their congressman or woman and said, don't support ATC reform. Really terrific. And it was a really good year for C, the basic med, the alternative uh, reform for uh, complying with the medical. Some 25,000 pilots have returned to flying because of basic med, and we've been able to hold off the giveaway of air traffic control to an airline-dominated corporation. Now, as Mark mentioned, all of you were a big help in that. Another big win, non-TSO'd equipment. You know what, I, I look at that as a real opportunity for people to invest in their aircraft and make them safer. You know, between the uh, technologies coming out from Garmin or TrueTrack or many others that now have found pathways, which uh, we played a big part in helping find pathways that could accelerate lower cost uh, avionics in these older airplanes, make them safer, uh, make them more current, if you will. Uh, it's really an exciting time. And we're just at the beginning of this movement, but the products that are available today that you can put in and replace old vacuum pumps, awesome for a couple thousand dollars. Electronic attitude indicators, affordable autopilots, angle of attack indicators, all things from the experimental world that we can now install in certificated aircraft, things that help make our older aircraft safer. And speaking of new technology, drones are changing the way farmers work the field. AOP senior photographer Mike Pfizer takes us there.
I am Robert Shefflin. This is my family's airfield, Whiskey November 26, Shefflin Field in Palouse, Washington. I am an aircraft mechanic and I run my dad's crop dusting business and I am also a drone pilot for Major and a private pilot. Major is a company that puts drones to work for people. I help them in their agriculture department by flying the EB Ag drone. Um, this was my grandpa's aircraft and he bought it brand new in 1966 and it's still in our family. Sometimes I get to fly it to my job sites which has been a lot of fun. Really a lot of my aeronautical knowledge from this airplane and from my private's pilot's license applies to this drone. A lot of it is making sure that I'm in a safe area, clear of airports, following all the guidelines, the certain elevations, checking um, notices to airmen, make sure that I can fly in that area. A lot of it is checking weather. Even when I drive to my job sites, I need to know the weather beforehand. It can waste a lot of people's time if I commit to a flight and get there and it's too windy to fly or it's, it's raining. My name's Robert Blair. I'm a fourth generation farmer in north central Idaho, a small town called Kendrick. 369 people, and I'm the VP of Agriculture for Measure. The area we're in right now on the farm is a very special place for a lot of reasons. Just over the hill in front of me here is the homestead. That's where the farm was started in 1903 by my great 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 uncle. The field we're looking at in the background is uh, garbanzo beans, or chickpeas. It's 96 acres. We're overlooking the Clearwater River, which is the route Lewis and Clark took from Montana to the Pacific Ocean. In 2006, I started using a UAV. I found out later that I was the first farmer in the U.S. to own and use a UAV in the United States. When we put a UAV out into the field to take imagery for agriculture, what we're looking to do is take those individual images, put them in software to stitch it together to make a composite so we can see the whole field. And so from that, I can make management decisions. Do I need to spray for a weed, insect disease? Maybe I have animal or wildlife damage that I can monitor and track. I don't have very many chances to get the perfect crop. And technology, especially UAVs, can help me do a better job of that. So yeah, this should be a pretty easy flight. The weather's nice today, not much wind. Thanks for that. Okay, going to install camera and battery. Checking the camera, looks good. I just love how they make these connectors for farmer fingers. The mission today is flying over garbs about 96 acres looking for animal damage. So we've just set up the path for the drone to fly, set up the perimeter, um, set up the ceiling, the flight plan is where the drone starts out and where the drone's going to land and which direction the drone's going to land. I look at my grandfather, I'm trying to answer the same questions he was 70 years ago. And that's how can we better our soils and better our productivity. Drones are transformative technology. We've had that in agriculture throughout history. John Deere's plow, McCormick's reaper, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, they all help transform agriculture through their technology advancements.
Well, it's just 90 miles from Key West, but Cuba is a world away from anything you'll find in the U.S. AOPA pilot editor Ian Twombly shows us how GA helps bridge the span. Cuba is only 90 miles from Key West, but culturally and politically, it's a world away. The revolution and subsequent embargo have left it off limits for more than 50 years. But today, things are changing. Flying to Cuba, while not without its challenges, is now within reach. It can be made even easier with the help of a handler. Eric Norber from Cuba Handling is one of the best. It's really no different than any IFR flight uh, anywhere in the U.S. It's uh, straightforward. The controllers speak excellent English. The procedures are exactly similar to what you would expect flying into any airport in the United States. Just another IFR flight. Hmm. And what about once you get there? I mean, um, you know, people are used to either mom and pop FBOs or maybe chains like Signature and, and that sort of thing. How, how would you describe the ground process? So Cuba, with the recent uh, allowing of private aircraft from the U.S., they're still trying to figure out kind of how to accommodate the expectations of private pilots. They don't have FBOs. It's a state-run handling company that provides the services. So you can get Avgas and, and you can expect typical services like you would at an airport in the United States. It's just that it, it doesn't come as naturally to them. So things sometimes can move a little bit slower. For those who make the effort, their persistence will be rewarded. More than just a country of cigars and rum, the Cuban people are welcoming, the culture is dynamic and bright, and the attractions fascinating. On-site guides are essential to having a fulfilling experience. Maria Rosa Rodriguez lives in Havana and offers a personal insight into her vibrant town. People that want to have a good time, there is live music everywhere. Um, Cubans are very, I would describe them as very happy, generally speaking. So they're always laughing, joking, uh, singing, dancing. And uh, our culture, it's different and uh, it's nice to experience it. But it gives you the chance to be technology free if you choose to, uh, if you don't go to a hotel and try to check Wi-Fi or something like that. But it gives you the opportunity to get in touch with people again, not with electronic devices or, you know, no Facebook most of the time because you're going to be doing things, interacting with people, dancing, uh, drinking, mojitos, which are different, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Music permeates life in Havana. It's in the streets, and if you're lucky, you can get a more personal experience. Rodriguez can arrange for a private concert with Yasek Manzano, one of Cuba's premier jazz trumpeters. It's one of the many experiences you can have in an amazing country that is closer than you think. So today, before the McDonald's, before the Burger Kings, go to Cuba and fly there. Ian Twombly, AOPA Live. So Warren, you've been to Cuba also, right? Yeah, I, I had the great fortune to go there uh, a year before, and uh, the Cuban people really are very welcoming. The Cuban government really wants to have GA, although, they, as they said in the piece, the infrastructure really isn't there yet. But when you really have to, we really have to emphasize that 
you need help to get there. You mm -hmm. just can't fly it on your own. And in truth, uh, particularly since the rules have been made more stringent again under the Trump administration, uh, there are only a very limited number of ways that you can you can go there. So you really do need a handler who knows how to do it and how to make it make it happen. But if you go, it's well worth it. Yeah, but we don't want to read about you running afoul of the State Department, so make sure you use a pro. <laughs> use a pro. <laughs> Well, if you're going to places like Cuba, it really helps to have a fast airplane. And AOPA pilot editor-at-large Tom Horn shows us Cessna's lightning rod, the TTX. It was a great performer when Lancer first designed it, but today the TTX is Cessna's fastest single-engine airplane. The Cessna TTX actually traces its roots back to the mid-90s and was spawned out of a NASA project looking for the next generation of general aviation transport aircraft. And it really wasn't until 2007 when, at that time, the Columbia 350 and 400 aircraft merged with the Cessna product line. And it was after that improvements were made, Cessna saw an opportunity in what is now the TTX to fill a, an important need within our aviation family. The TTX is loaded with advanced features, like a wing leading edge cuff that preserves airflow over the wing at high angles of attack. And most airplanes are ordered with the TKS Weeping Wing Ice Protection System. In the cockpit, Side stick controls and Garmin's two-screen G2000 avionics are the rule, complete with a center-mounted touchscreen controller. A standard equipment oxygen system for high-altitude cruising on those long trips, and even a panel-mounted pulse oximeter to monitor your oxygen level. TTX also has good runway performance. It can take off using less runway than its nearest competitor, the Cirrus SR-22T. In fact, takeoffs are 800 feet less at 7,000 feet and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. The TTX can also climb to flight level 250 six minutes faster and 20 nautical miles sooner than the Cirrus SR-22T. In high-speed cruise, the TTX can fly you in style with an 85% power range of 800 nautical miles. That same trip will take just three hours, 37 minutes, burning 90 gallons of fuel. Designed to optimize both business and pleasure flying, situational awareness is optimal with the G2000. And for all its high performance attributes, it's easy to land. Bottom line, the Cessna TTX may be one of the best high value, best kept secrets in today's fleet of new airplanes anywhere. Tom Horn, AOPA Live. Let's slow it down a bit and come down a lot closer to the earth. Imagine throwing a party in the desert and having backcountry flyers from all over the world come in. That pipe dream is a reality at the High Sierra Fly-In. It's a dry lake bed in the middle of nowhere. The setting that we have here, we call it the high desert. Way up in the mountains. Out in the desert north of Reno, you'll find the Dead Cow Lake Bed. She's dry, she's empty, um, there's just infinite places to go. Not much lives here except a spirit of adventure and a scorpion or two. But for one week a year, this barren land brings together like-minded pilots. From across the West and around the world, they gather. Came to it two years ago and it's been the best experience I've ever had in aviation. Couldn't help but come back for more. Tim House came up from Australia. Because it's the best flying on Earth. Dust is stirred by tailwheels and tundra tires, along with anything that can fly and dares to in this environment. 
the mountains are a playground for the experienced. The lake bed and fly in family friendly, and the campfire is welcoming to all. It captivates a lot of folks, it brings a lot of people together. And together, they watch a new type of flying contest on the playa. Stoldrak is in its third year. Two airplanes take off at the same time, side by side. The green stars, this is going to be awesome. And they're getting down and back in three quarters of a mile, literally, in about a minute, 28, minute, 30 seconds. It's incredible. People think of this concept, stole drag, man, they're flying around and doing crazy things in the air, and really that's not it. It's down and back. You stop at one end on heading after the line. Turn around, come all the way back, do the same thing. First guy that stops wins. That's stole drag. Looks like Mark is slightly ahead. It's going to come down to who gets stopped the soonest. It's a clean finish. Here we go. Here it go. is Three. all coming down to brakes and heading control. Oh! And Mark Brady takes the finals. Our new world champion flying the best Dutch carbon job. Let's hear it for Mark Brady. I was so close. Oh my gosh, I was dying. Wow. Oh, I didn't wow. think I'd get it, that tail to drop. It's just humbling to fly with these guys. I mean, these are the top pilots in the world. And they're flying their best on some of the most remote land in the country and an event like no other. The High Sierra, for me, man, is turning people on to the coolest days, coolest times of their life. And as long as we keep doing it safe, that's what it's all about. From the Dead Cow Lake Bed, Paul Hero, AOPA Live. And there's another stool competition that gets pretty hot, but this one happens way up where it's usually cold. AOPA technical editor Mike Collins takes us to the Valdez Stool Competition in Alaska. You've seen the videos on YouTube. Tundra-tired tail draggers landing like helicopters on the Arctic tundra. But in Valdez, it's serious business. We got started as a economic development idea. Now in its 14th year, the Valdez Flying and Air Show is a big draw, but the main event is its legendary stole competition. The contest uh, has evolved a little bit, but how we do it now uh, is you score a takeoff and a landing pair. Uh, you are scored when the main wheels leave the ground. Uh, the distance there, and then you, are, you have to be on the line or beyond uh, with, the, with the main wheels on landing, and then how much it takes you to get stopped. And pilots from all over make the trek to show off machine and skills. Taking off can be about horsepower, and landing is about pilot technique. One pilot shows that he has both. That's Frank Knapp flying his one-of-a-kind little cub. Yeah, the fuselage itself started out in 1939 J3. Um, we rebuilt everything around it and, and eventually including the fuselage pretty much. The modified airplane weighs 800 pounds and is powered by a 180 horse O320. It's just kind of the culmination of uh, all those things that over flying years you wanted to try and this has given us a platform to be able to try it. And clearly it worked. 10 feet, 5 inches. 10 feet, 5 inches. <laughs> Knapp won the competition and set a new record with his 10-foot, 5-inch landing. The 14-foot, 7-inch takeoff was pretty impressive, too. Fly-in President Joe Prax said the conditions in Valdez are perfect for that kind of flying. The stole contest works so well here because we have a steady sea breeze. We're obviously at sea level, and uh, as you may have noticed, it was a little cooler than other places. Count on those cool and breezy conditions to fuel a red-hot competition. Valdez, Alaska, Mike Collins, AOPA Live. So for context on that 10 foot 5 inch landing, <laughs> this desk on the riser back here is about 12 feet long. He could have landed between Tom and Melissa. 
Yeah, wow. I mean, landing in half the length of the airplane. I mean, it's just, in, just insane. That is crazy. And obviously, a lot of people liked that video this year on YouTube. It got a lot of people. It's our most it. watched video. Yeah, most so. watched video on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to see why. Uh, those, those pilots are just in a league of their own. <laughs> That's really, really is pretty amazing. Well, as we continue our look at 2017 highlights, general aviation safety is shining the brightest. A great year in general aviation safety. Record lows in terms of our fatal accident rate. Again, this year, that was followed by a record low we set last year. And that's really a tribute to pilots and the industry as a whole. I think we stand as a beacon for other industries and in how we collaborate and share information and get word out about safety topics and training. McSpadden also points to more advanced avionics and displays that improve situational and weather awareness. Better safety information plays a role too. This year, pilots accessed Air Safety Institute information and training nearly 4 million times. And here's another amazing statistic. So we took a look at the fatal accidents that happened last year, and only 20% of the fatal pilots accessed safety information in the last two years. So that means more than 80% of the pilots that have had fatal accidents aren't routinely viewing safety information. Okay, well, you know, guys, I was talking to Richard McSpadden the other day, and that statistic just blew my mind. 80% of the pilots in fatal accidents never have taken a, a safety course as near as we can determine. And we know that something like 50% of pilots out there, in general, have not taken any safety courses. So that's a big goal for the Air Safety Institute for next year, is try to get more people to take some of their safety courses, because the Data seems to indicate that if you take the safety course, you're less likely to be involved in an accident. And I think uh, in addition to the safety benefit, there's a other benefit. It's free. It's there for you. Go use it. Tell your friends. They're absolutely free. You don't have to be an AOPA member to take the courses. And a lot of insurance companies will give you a bit of a break for participating in some of the ASI courses. And some of them have FAA WINGS credits attached to them as well. They do indeed. And a lot of the courses, just they're, they're good to watch, they're well-produced, so it's definitely worthwhile to go see. Well, when we come back, things will get a little meta. We'll shoot an eclipse during the eclipse. And where you can go to learn to fly Mustangs. AOPA Live this week, the Director's Cut 2017. There are many important things to consider before purchasing an aircraft. Let the experts at Aerospace Reports help guide you through the process. We combine expert knowledge with our long-standing commitment to personalized customer service to perfect your transaction. Learn more at aerospacereports.com. Welcome back. So where were you during the Great American Eclipse? On August 21st, a path of totality stretched from Oregon to the Carolinas. AOPA Life had coverage from four spots across the country, including my visit to Triple Tree Aerodrome in South Carolina. Turn right at Charlie, contact ground 123.9, yeah. welcome to Triple Tree. Triple Tree started welcoming campers on Sunday. The privately owned airport has a pristine 7,000 foot grass runway and beautiful facilities making it the ideal place to camp under the wing. Kirby Hornaday and Jeff Mueller flew in and camped under the wing of a yak. We're getting Incredible. married in less than two months, so <laughs> crammed into a tent where it's hot and <laughs> it's testing, but it's awesome. <laughs> Noah Watts, a member of the Golden Knights U.S. Army Parachute Team, was also camping. He flew a Cessna 206 from Fayetteville, North Carolina to camp with friends. It's, uh, it's nice to, to see a bunch of people come together for whatever the reason. Everyone comes out and flies and just has a good time. Lots of fellowship, especially here at Triple Tree. Dinner on Sunday night, a Triple Tree favorite. Steak night with a P-51 in the background and RC airplanes buzzing overhead. Monday morning brought a camping breakfast essential, bacon, and hundreds of arrivals into Triple Tree. Mike Price flew in for the day with his goddaughter, Zoe Greenhouse. Seeing all my pilot friends who I know will be here today, and uh, most importantly to see the expression on her face when the total solo <laughs> eclipse happens to me. That's going to be special for us. Throughout the day, while they are waiting, onlookers were perfectly happy to relax under the wing and join the community in watching all kinds of airplanes arrive. As the eclipse began, excitement grew, and despite all the good food, people here must have been hungry. Well, it looks um, like a banana. I would say a piece of cheese, actually a nice, sharp cheddar. It kind of looks like an orange slice that I bit out of, and now it's just smiling at me. And as totality was reached, Hey, 
that's great, fantastic. What a what an experience. Never thought I'd see it. Look at the Klimskis. <laughs> Gorgeous. Great. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Who would have ever thought? Yeah. Uh oh. Oh, it's, it's coming time. back. Yep. <laughs> oh, there it comes. What do you think about that? Yeah. <laughs> Is that cool? Yeah. Don't look up the okay? <laughs> and just like that, it was over, and dozens of airplanes started heading home with the memories of this special time here at Triple Tree, a testament to the kinds of experiences that can only be had with general aviation. This event has been tro truly just a significant um, benchmark for many people. Me especially, thank y'all for coming. It was just the, the highlight, really, of a lot of our lives. And during the eclipse, AOPA senior photographer Chris Rose captured this stellar image. It's an eclipse jet shot air to air with the total eclipse behind it. That was an amazing <laughs> photo. <laughs> had to be the, the coolest, uh, most creative photo out of the eclipse, I think. I mean, yeah. there's there's no reason why you go do that, but boy, you look at it and you're like, <laughs> how cool is this? I don't know anyone else that uh, that uh, got such a great photograph as Chris Rose did. You know, so, some folks have asked how how he did it, and the way they did it was they took the doors off of an A36 Bonanza, and then Chris had a very very powerful strobe. Yeah, you can see how he rigged that up there. That is pretty interesting. It may not have a celestial event as its namesake, but another very light jet is shining like the sun this year. The Cirrus SF-50 Vision Jet is as cool as it gets. AOPA Live host Tom Haynes got to fly one. There's a reason for the unusual egg shape of the Vision Jet. Cirrus started from the inside, creating a wide, comfortable cabin big enough for five adults and two children. Plenty of room to stretch out door and seats designed for easy access for everybody. And then they designed the airplane around the cabin space. So the Vision Jet was, uh, we designed the Vision Jet. It was supposed to be the natural step up from our uh, SR-22 to the Vision Jet. So our, our owners who are used to flying the SR-20, 22, 22T, the Vision Jet's kind of the next logical step up aircraft. The step up is easy. All controls and switches are exactly where an SR-20 or 22 pilot would expect to find them. Systems are highly automated. Like the pressurization, there's nothing yeah. to do. It, it, it knows your destination and what the elevation rest of your destination is. automatically schedules the pressurization. Because as we were mentioning, all the systems are integrated. We're not sitting here studying all the engine instruments. They're in the green, they're good. If something's wrong, we'll get an enunciation. Uh -huh. And then we'll go to a checklist to figure out what what to do next. Simple enough that a guy with no turbine time is now demonstrating the airplane. Well, my experience has been um, pretty much mainly single engine, uh, normally aspirated airplane, piston airplanes. And by the third flight, I was comfortable flying the airplane without any help from the right seat. Matt says a few hundred hours of SR time will set you up for success in the Vision Jet. The jet is designed for the successful owner pilot. It fits a niche above high performance pistons and below more complex turbine aircraft. At 300 knots, hey, it's not the fastest, but more speed, now it costs you at least a million dollars more. Really fits a regional mission. It was really designed to, you know, fly 800 pounds, 800 nautical miles, or, you know, 1,000 pounds for uh, 600 nautical miles. In keeping with that regional mission, the Vision Jet fits into smaller airports. 85 to 95 knot approach speed keeps things slow and easy, even on a circling approach. And oh, of course, it's fun to fly. It's no secret that the U.S. pilot population is declining, but here at AOPA we have an expanding program to reverse that trend. We call it You Can Fly, and it's moving the needle. Yeah, we are getting a lot of pilots back in the air. You know, so our four initiatives, we start with high school initiative that's aimed at getting uh, quality aviation education in front of young people in the classroom. Our flight training initiative is aimed at improving the student pilot completion rate. we got flying clubs where we want uh, more people to fly more after they get their certificates. And of course, Rusty Pilots is designed to bring people back into flying. And those four initiatives combined, we've really brought more people uh, new, new into aviation and also got more people in the air. And we've just opened the You Can Fly Academy here in Frederick, a model for the flight training facility of the future. 
And as the You Can Fly program helps bolster the pilot population, some people might have a bucket list airplane to fly. And by all accounts, it might just be a P-51 Mustang. If you want to learn to fly them, there's one place that stands out head and shoulders above the rest. Come with me to Kissimmee, Florida, and let's check out Stallion 51. They call him Mr. Mustang. 21,000 hours total time, nearly 10,000 in a Mustang. Lee is the guy, he is, you know, I mean, it's, people say it and it's true, he's Mr. Mustang. And for three decades, he's been leading the world's premier Mustang training center, Stallion 51. Training is where it all began. With a Navy test pilot school contract and uh, short order, told the bank we had a contract, told the military we had an airplane, everything passed in the middle of the night. That led to the first pony in the stable, a TF-51 named Crazy Horse. The two-seater has become one of the most photographed Mustangs of all time. In 30 years, there have been close to 200 graduates of the Mustang course. Well, it's a very high standard. It's a syllabus, all syllabus driven. Takes about five days, flying, you know, twice a day normally. The intense program has produced some of the world's most famous Mustang airshow pilots. Ed Shipley started the Four Horsemen team. The very core uh, value of all the flying that I do, uh, and all the safety things, all the performance stuff, all the skill sets that I've learned have come out of uh, being down around Stallion and, and flying with Lee. Ed and other graduates gathered at Stallion 51 headquarters ahead of Sun and Fun to mark three decades of Mustang excellence. But it wasn't a party. True to Stallion roots, it was focused on safety and education. For us to come down here and get that kind of expertise in these little forms is really, it's pretty priceless. Priceless training that will help these elite pilots continue to fly safely as the men and machines continue to age. You know, if you look at it, everybody goes, well, when the last Mustang guy dies, the chapter's closed. No, it's just a new chapter. And, uh, you know, with the talent that's coming on board and some of the dedicated people that are coming on board, I think we can easily go for the next 25 or 30 years. And among the graduates is a part of that next chapter in the story of Mustang, one of the younger program graduates. Well, Andrew McKenna is a really good example. Came in, very planned, very disciplined, uh, went through our whole checkout program, and went on to uh, not only fly the Mustang, but fly it very well. Andrew credits all that to Lee and Stallion 51. There is no other place where you can get real military-like training on these aircraft. Learning how to do buffet tracking, learning how to uh, do aborted takeoffs, knowing how to stall the aircraft, knowing how to recover from really unusual attitudes. I mean, you know, if it wasn't for Stallion, I, I can just tell, I wouldn't be standing here. There's just no way. Andrew's training with Lee has led him to be the newest pilot in the Heritage Flight Program. He makes his first flight at Sun and Fun. It's one of many opportunities fostered by Lee Lauterbach and Stallion 51. You know, he's the uh, encyclopedia of uh, Mustangs. Everything stems from the top down to the bottom in any organization. And for Lee to be that committed to this airplane uh, and to demonstrate it and do it at the highest level, that just speaks volumes. And, you know, a lot of these guys out here, all the graduates that are out here, are uh, a testament to that. Kissimmee Gateway Airport, Paul Hiram, AOPA Live. We have to say another congratulations to Lee Lauterbach. He was just given the highest honor an air show pilot can receive. Lee is the 2017 recipient of the International Council of Air Shows Sword of Excellence. That is a really big honor and what a great guy to get it. And we leave you this week with the story of another beloved airplane, this one with a very different mission. Float beavers are a favorite of fishing lodges in Alaska. AOPA senior photographer Chris Rose brings the story of these beautiful airplanes and the pilots who fly them in search of the big catch.
Author and naturalist John Muir once said that Alaska is one of the most wonderful places on earth. Located just north of the town of King Salmon, Alaska Rainbow Lodge gives visitors affirmation of Muir's belief. Flying a beaver is a dream. They're the best, best flying airplane I've ever been in. Uh, they are big. They can be a little tough to move around on the ground, and you do have a handful on takeoff. They have a lot of torque, and you can be fighting the currents and the winds. But once you're, once you're in the air, they're fingertip airplanes. They're light. You don't have to fight them to get them to do anything you want them to. Um, I, I haven't ever really experienced another airplane that's quite that good at that, at, at translating what you want it to do into action. started as a groundsman wanting to become a guide and kind of not necessarily fell into the pilot thing but saw an opportunity here and had a few people kind of help me along the way and I decided to go for it and so definitely just being around the beavers and so your first you're saying your first flight was in a, in a yeah. beaver at the right? yeah well other than airlines yeah right but first small aircraft was in a beaver on floats yeah and uh, what uh, what appealed to you about it? Everything. I mean, just, I don't know, what's not to love? We came in from Anchorage to the lodge on my first flight through Lake Clark Pass, and it was just gorgeous. Um, taking off and landing on water is an experience everyone needs to have, and fell in love. I think that's kind of the story of a lot of people up here, but I'd say it's true. What do you love so much about this type of flying in this location? What keeps you coming back? It, it's the freedom and the, the challenge. I think every day when you get back to the lodge and you, you've got the people fishing, you've brought them back, they're ecstatic. And a lot of people come up here with a lot of uh, nervousness about flying in Alaska because they hear about the aircraft accidents in Alaska and they're nervous so our goal is to have them fall asleep in an airplane on the way back from fishing when they're that relaxed and they trust us that much and we've flown smooth um, then we've done our job uh, on 
almost no more incredible place than, than the Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula for flying. The mountains, the the lakes that are colors that you can't you can't even name the color blue. It is. Um, there's no roads. There's no people. Uh, it's it's nothing but mountains and lakes and rivers and airplanes and and uh, what could be better than that. Oh gosh, that was beautiful. Unbelievable images out of that, that beautiful shoot. It really was, yeah. You know, and kudos to Chris Rose, he was one of the first people to go get his Part 107 certificate to be able to use drones in our editorial coverage of stories like that, and I really look forward to seeing him implement that technology further. Of course, on the other hand, how could you mess up a shoot in Alaska? <laughs> yeah, it makes me want to go fishing there for sure. Right, no it's kidding. Amazing. Uh, not fishing, flying. Uh, I love flying, fly. yeah. Well, I love you flying. Could fly in Alaska. and go fishing. Yeah, flying and fishing. And then fly Sounds our fish good. back home, right? Yes. That'd be great. <laughs> well, hey, we're so grateful that you've uh, spent some of your holiday season here with us. We are going to post this show and then take off until the second week of January. So hopefully we'll uh, catch up from the, the hard jobs we all have going to Alaska <laughs> and things like that. Well, thank you all for watching. Uh, we couldn't do this work without your support. No, we sure couldn't, and it means so much to us when you come up and speak to us at the aviation events and tell us you watched the show, because we, we love what we're doing, and we're glad that you like it, too. So until next year, thanks so much for watching, and we'll hope you'll join us again on Thursdays for AOPA Live this week.